the skeleton or the skeletal system. Uh, we talked about bones in general last week, bone tissue. Now we're going to talk about the specific bones in two regions, or two divisions of our skeleton, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. Your skeletal system uh, is mostly bone. There is cartilage in some areas. We talked about articulate cartilage before. We'll talk more about that um, <clears throat> when we talk about joints and ligaments that connect the bones and reinforce the joints. And a skeleton counts for about 20% of your body mass. So a 100 pound person, 20 pounds would be a skeleton. So we do divide the skeleton into two groups of bones, the axial skeleton, which forms the axis uh, of your body, your skull, your thoracic cavity, uh, cage, and your spinal column. <clears throat> the other would be the appendicular skeleton, which we'll get to later, which are the appendages and the bone that attach the appendages to the axial skeleton. So in uh, typical axial skeleton, there are approximately 80 bones divided into those three regions, which we'll, we'll talk about the skull in this section, and then the next one I'll talk about the vertebral column and the thoracic cage. Function of the axial skeleton is to form the longitudinal axis, axis of the body. Uh, it helps to support the head, the neck, and the trunk. Uh, it's very important for protection. Bones protect our brain, protect our spinal cord, and spinal column and also protect our thoracic organs like such as the heart and lungs. So here in green we have the uh, axial skeleton highlighted with the appendicular skeleton in kind of a, a brown color. <coughs> and from the other side. So the skull is the most complex bony structure in the body. Uh, it's going to be the biggest part of this chapter. It's made up of two sets of bones, the cranium bones, which enclose the brain and cranial cavity and provide sites of attachment for head and neck muscles, and the facial bones, which form the framework of the face. They contain cavities for special sense organs, uh, sight, taste, smell. They also provide openings for air and food passages. They hold our teeth in place and they're very important for anchoring our facial muscles so that we can make facial expressions. Most of the skull bones are flat bones and they are firmly locked together. The exception to that is the mandible. The joints <coughs> are called sutures. They have a serrated sawtooth appearance. You probably saw some last week in the lab. So here we have the sutures, here are squamous suture, coronal suture, lambdoid suture from the side. So the facial bones form the anterior aspect, the front, uh, the cranium forms the rest of the skull. Cranium is divided into a vault and a base. The cranial vault, the calvaria, forms the superior, so the upper and side, lateral and back portions of the skull, as well as the forehead. Cranial base forms the inferior aspects of the skull. And internally, the base is divided into three steps. They look like steps, uh, but we call them fossae. The anterior, middle, and posterior fossae. The brain is going to sit within those fossa and close by the cranium vault. Uh, and this area is often referred to as the cranial cavity. Here's our steps, this lower, mid, upper. And from the side, we can see how the brain fits in there. The cranium also has other cavities. There's the middle and internal ear cavities, the nasal cavity, the orbits that holds the eyeballs. There are at least 85 different openings. So when your mother said you had holes in your head, you did, you have about 85 of them that are named called foramina, canals, and fissures. They provide passageways for the spinal cord, major blood vessels, and the 12 cranial nerves. So here are the major cavities. I won't go into each of them. You should look through them in your book, however. 
So the cranium is made up of eight bones. Uh, two of them are pairs of bones. So we have the frontal bone, the parietal bones, the left and right, the occipital bone, the temporal bones, left and right, the sphenoid and the ethmoid bone. The frontal bone is a shell-shaped bone forming the anterior portion of the cr cranium. Uh, it has a vertical part called the squamous region, also more commonly referred to us by, as the forehead. Inferior portions end at the suborbital margin, uh, sorry, supraorbital margins, and an area that's just below the eyebrows. It forms the superior wall of the orbits, the eye orbits, and most of the anterior cranial fossa. The supraorbital foramen, or notch, allows the supraorbital artery and nerve to pass to the forehead. The glabella is an area in the front of the bone between the orbits, and the frontal sinuses are located just lateral to that glabella. Shown here, again, I'm going to go through these slides, but not with a lot of details. Most of this information you're going to have a better chance of getting during the lab, but we've been talking about this area up here. At the base of the cranial cavity, we see the uh, ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bone. And here is not an artist drawing, but an image of a skull. So the parietal bones and the major sutures, there are two large parietal bones that form the most superior and lateral aspects of the cranial vault. And there are four suture mark articulations of parietal bones with the front, occipital, and temporal bones. There is a coronal suture between parietal bones and frontal bone. Uh, if you think of a coronal section, we learned about in chapter one, that's where the name comes from. A sagittal suture between the right and left parietal bones. Again, think back to sagittal sections in chapter one. Lambdoid suture is between the parietal bones and the occipital bone. And the squamous suture is between, are between the parietal and temporal bones on each side of the skull. lot of information in images in this chapter. A lot of information you'll use or get in the lab as you go through skulls uh, and other skeletal parts. So uh, don't ignore these images as you are trying to do your homework or your reading. The occipital bone forms the skull's posterior and posterior cranial, cranial fossa. It articulates with the parietal, temporal, and sphenoid bones. In it, we have the foramen magnum, which literally uh, translates to a large hole. It's a large hole through which the brain connects with the spinal cord. In fact, as the brain passes through the foramen magnum, the brain stem, uh, we call it spinal cord as soon as it passes the foramen magnum. It's flanked by a pair of occipital condyles that are going to articulate, form a joint with the first vertebrae. And there is also the hypoglossal canal that allows cranial nerve 12 to go through. The external occipital protrusion is a protrusion just above the foramen magnum. The external occipital crest are ridges that are the sites of attachment for ligamentum nuque which we'll talk about when we talk about muscles. Uh, superior and inferior nuchal lines are the sites of attachment for many of the neck and back muscles we'll see in a couple of chapters. Again, here are the images which you should work through in your book. Uh, I will point out the sutural bones. Uh, we talked about the differences in the number of bones. The temporal bones are paired bones that make up the inferior lateral aspects of the skull, part of the cranial base. They're divided into regions. There are three regions. Uh, squamous is the first, where the zygomatic process articulates with a zygomatic bone, forming the zygomatic arch and the mandibular fossa that makes up our temporomandibular joint. Um, 
and then we have the tympanic region that surrounds the external acoustic meatus, which we often refer to as the external ear canal. The petrus is going to house the middle and internal ear cavities, makes up part of the middle cranial fossa. There are some foramen penetrating this petrous region, including the jugular foramen, which allows for three cranial nerves, the carotid canal for the internal carotid artery, the foramen lacerum, a jagged opening that's covered by cartilage in a living individual, and the internal acoustic meatus and the stylo, styloid mastoid, stylo, styloid mastoid, word for amen which is for cranial nerve passageways we also have the mastoid and styloid processes here which are attachments for neck and tongue muscles i will point out here that there are a number of styloid processes throughout the skeleton they have the general appearance of a pen which is where the name comes from but so that when we talk about a styloid process in the arm, it's going to be different than the one we're talking about here in the cranium. And here is the styloid process. Whoops. Yeah. Usually the styloid process, or quite often, is broken off in uh, preserved skulls. It's quite fragile there. Here's a temporal bone, isolated from the others. Mastoid process has cavities called sinuses, which are referred to as mastoid air cells. The mastoiditis can develop if a middle ear infection spreads into the mastoid process area. Mastoid air cells are separated from the brain by a very thin bony plate, which increases the chance of infections in those places moving to the brain. The sphenoid bone is a complex bat-shaped bone. It's a keystone bone. It articulates with all the others, holds everything in that tight uh, formation. We have sphenoid sinuses within the body of the sphenoid. Uh, the body also includes the cella turcica, a prominence that includes the hypophosial fossa, which is the area that encloses the pituitary gland. Um, sphenoid contains three pairs of processes, the greater wings, the lesser wings, and the pterygoid process. It contains several foramina, including the optic canals, which were passageways for the optic nerves, the superior orbital fissure, cranial nerve passageway, the foramen rotundum, the foramen ovale, which are passageways for cranial nerves. Uh, we'll talk about it. Um, I'm going to let that go for now. Uh, the foramen spinosum, which is an opening for arteries. Here are the sphenoid bones. They do kind of look like a bat. The ethmoid bone is the deepest skull bone. Its superior part is formed by the cribriform plate, so it's, the, uh, it's also going to form the roof of the nasal cavity and the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. The cristigale are found here, which are triangular processes, that is the point of attachment, attachment for the dura matter. Uh, the perpendicular plate is here, which forms the superior and nasal septum, flanked by lateral masses, also contain sinuses called ethmoid air cells. The lateral masses extend medially to form the superior and middle nasal conchi. And the orbital plates are going to contribute to the medial walls of the orbits. Here is our ethmoid bone. Sutural bones are those tiny irregular shaped bones that appear within sutures. Uh, we don't know really why they're there, um, what their significance is, I should say. Uh, not everyone has sutural bones. You could check our, we have three or four skulls in the lab, and I'm not sure, I, some of them do have some sutural bones, but not all. The facial bones. 
base is made up of 14 bones. 12 of those are pairs. So the mandible and the vomer are not. You've got one mandible, two maxillary, two zygomatic, two nasal, two lacrimal, two palatine, one vomer, and two inferior nasal conchi. The mandible is the largest, strongest bone of the face. It's got a U-shape. It's the U-shaped lower jaw bone. It's made up of the body, which we think of as the chin, and two upright rami that go upwards. The mandibular angle is the point where the rami and the chin meet. The coronoid process is on the superior end of the rami that serves as an insertion point for the temporalis muscle, a very large muscle. The condylar process is the posterior is posterior to the coronoid and forms part of the temporomandibular joint. And the space between those two processes is known as the mandibular notch. The body consists of alveolar processes that contain sockets for our teeth and the mandibular symphysis ridge. The foramina would include the mandibular foramen for nerves and the mental foramina for nerves and blood vessels. Here's our mental foramina. Foramen. The maxillary bones or the maxillae are immediately fused to form the upper jaw and the central facial skeleton. Their upper teeth are held in alveolar processes. We also have the anterior nasal spine, the palatine process, the frontal process, the zygomatic process, and the maxillary sinuses uh, in their particular locations. There are openings for nerves and blood vessels, including the inferior orbital fissure, the infraorbital foramen, and the incisive fossa and canal. The zygomatic bones form the cheeks and the inferior lateral margins of the orbits. Zygomatic bone articulates with the zygomatic process of the temporal, frontal, and maxillary bones. And that's kind of a teal colored bone here. The nasal bones form the bridge of the nose. They articulate with the frontal, maxillary, and ethmoid bones and attach to the cartilage that forms the tip of our nose, the end of our nose. The lacrimal bones are going to form medial walls of the orbits. They are going to articulate with the frontal, maxillary, and ethmoid bones. And they have the lacrimal fossa, which is where we will find lacrimal sacs, where tears are produced and the passageways for those tears to drain. Palatine bones are L-shaped bones that form two bony plates, the horizontal plate, which completes the posterior one-third of the hard palate, and the perpendicular plate that forms part of the postolateral walls of the nasal cavity and the small part of the orbits. The vomer bone is shaped like a plow. Uh, it's one of those old V-shaped plows, not like a flat plow you would have on the front of a pickup truck. Uh, part of the nasal septum. Our vomer bone. And better angle here. So, this part, the septal cartilage, would not be there in a preserved skull. That's cartilage. We would end at the nasal bone. The inferior nasal conchi are a pair of bones that form parts of the lateral walls of the na nasal cavity. They're the largest of the three pairs of conchi. The ethmoid bone forms the other two pairs, so we have five pairs. The hyoid bone is everybody's favorite bone. It's not a bone in the skull, but doesn't really fit in anywhere else. It's in the anterior neck, just below the mandible. And everyone loves it because it's always on anatomy trivia questions. 
the hyoid bone is the only bone in the body that does not directly articulate with any other bone. It's not connected to any other bone. It is an anchor, it's anchored in place by ligaments. It serves as a movable base for the tongue and a site of attachment for muscles we use in swallowing and speech. The special characteristics of the orbits in the nasal cavity, the orbits are cavities that encase the eyes and lacrimal glands. They are sites of attachment for eye muscles. They're formed by parts of seven different bones, which we've been through once, but in case you've forgotten, frontal, sphenoid, zygomatic, maxilla, palatine, lacrimal, and ethmoid bones all contribute to the eye orbits. The nasal cavity is formed from the parts of several bones. The roof comes from the cribriform plates of the ethmoid bone. The lateral walls, the superior and middle conchi of the ethmoid, perpendicular plates of the palatine, and the inferior nasal conchi. Spaces between the conchi are called meatuses. And conchi increase turbulence of airflow so that we can better humidify or dehumidify air as it goes in and out, uh, as well as warm it as it goes in and, uh, and recover that heat when it in and out. The floor is the process of the palatine and maxillary bones. The nasal septum is the bony posterior formed by the vo vomer and the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. The front part, again, is formed by septal cartilage, and that septal cartilage can't be seen on our preserved skeletons. Paranasal sinuses are formed from the five skull bones, the frontal, the sphenoid, the ethmoid, and the paired maxillary bones. They are mucus-lined, air-filled spaces which function to warm and humidify air. They also make the skull lighter than it would be if they were solid bones. And we use them to enhance the resonance of our voice. And they are shown there from the front and here from the side. And I believe that's going to bring us to the end of the skull. It does.